I will, I will show you first that Siegemeyer actually says this multiple times. Uh, these are uh, just a subset of the quotes that he makes. Uh, so on page 16 he says, information invariably reflects the prior activity of conscious and intelligent persons. Uh, on page 343 he says, information invariably originates from an intelligent source. Uh, on page 376, uh, it's in invariably creative intelligence played a role in the origin of that entity, or in this case, information. So he says this over and over again. This is one reason the book is 500 pages long. He keeps saying this. He makes you want to cry. And you know, it's, it's always invariably. I, 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 I want to give him a thesaurus. Anyway, so I, I want you to understand, I'm, I'm trying to establish very clearly, this is what they claim. They claim that the only way you can get information or complexity is by the action of an intelligent entity, all right? And I don't think they would deny that, although they seem to argue, deny that that's their argument. Well, anyway, uh, this is their argument. <coughs> and I want to make a case that, no, it's not true, that uh, complexity can arise by all kinds of mechanisms. And for instance, here's a, here's a really simple, crude example. Uh, this is a pile of driftwood from the west coast of Washington State. Uh, you've probably got these kinds of things out here on your coast. Uh, what it is is just tide and storm throw up piles of, of driftwood and it accumulates in the lump and it acts like a little wall. So here we've got the creation of a wall with considerable complexity to it. I mean, that's all those branches jiggle jagging all, all over the place. This is a very complex wall. Uh, and there's no intelligence behind it. Now, that's what I assert, and I, I guarantee you that if there are any creationists here, they would agree with me that there's no intelligence behind this, create, this event, building this simple wall, which has got a lot of complex components to it. But the point is, it was created. It is complex. It just wasn't created with a purpose or an intent. We can find lots of examples of, of other kinds of walls. So here, here for instance, is another wall. Uh, that one, you'll believe, somebody made it, right? You have no question about it. You see that kind of brick wall and you'll, you won't say, well, oh, the wind was just particularly fierce one day and picked up a bunch of bricks and happened to pile them up in this, in this way. No, you wouldn't say that at all. You'd say that, that was a designed wall. But what is making it designed? It's not complexity, because that wall is actually a little simpler than the driftwood wall. It's certainly easier to describe. What makes it an element of design is pattern. So it's got a nice re re repeated pattern to it. Uh, it's history. We know how this thing, how these kinds of walls are made. We know that bricks and mortar are human creations that can be built this way. And you may have seen people build walls, so you know how it's done. So you wouldn't argue that that, that is a, a natural construction. So when we see natural features, what we can say is, is that they're built by chance and necessity. So chance throws up a particular pattern of driftwood on the beach. Uh, and necessity just means that this wood will have certain shapes because it's, it's derived from plant material. Uh, it tends to be functionally unspecified or diverse. The, the wall wasn't built to be a wall. It's a pile of wood. We will all agree on that. And it's also fairly complex in that it's hard to describe. It's, it doesn't have a repeating element that can simplify the structure. Uh, it may be made of very diverse components. Whereas the artificial wall is built with intent and it's functionally specific and is relatively simple. This is one of the important things about design, about engineering. If you go to an engineer and ask them to build something, uh, what you want them to do is build something that is complicated enough to do exactly the job you want, but not more complicated. What engineers do is they try to simplify the pieces that are redundant, that are unnecessary, that add expense or weight or whatever to whatever they're building. So what, what you often find is that simplicity is a characteristic of design. Here's another example. Uh, this is complex. I think we'd all agree. This is the Mandelbrot set, which many people play with on their computers. You can find all kinds of cool programs that will generate these for you. Uh, what it is is the expression of a simple mathematical function. And you can zoom in on this, and you can zoom in on details, and it's more and more complicated. There's all kinds of elaborate uh, form built into the calculation of this function. Yet the function is just this one little <coughs> line there, where you're using the coordinates on the complex number plane, you're plugging in this formula and asking whether, uh, whether the formula reaches a, a particular value within a certain range of iterations, and it generates this. 
So simplicity can build complexity. Now this is a this is necessity though. This is what, what drives this is necessity. When you when you run that formula through your computer, in any computer you use, you will always get the same pattern over and over again. So that's not very analogous to biological life. But when we look at biology, we can find that there are people who are also looking at measures of information and complexity. And I'm just gonna briefly show you one example. And this is something called uh, a metric called Shannon information. There are other metrics for measuring information. If they're going to be useful, though, what they have to be is they have to be rigorously defined mathematically. That's important. Shannon information is rig rigorously defined mathematically. And you can go in and measure a sequence of DNA, for instance, and estimate the information content. In particular, you can measure the information contact with, content with respect to a specific function. And this is some. Uh, just one diagram from some work by a guy named Schneider who did a very simple thing. He, he generated random strands of DNA. And because they're initially random, their information content is defined in a zero, which I think most people would agree with. If you just got a random sequence, it doesn't have any particular information to it. But then what he does is he puts it through rep replication with mutation and selection for sequences in this DNA that will bind to a particular protein. So he's basically looking for uh, uh, receptor sequences that will appear in, you know, just by random processes in this particular process. And he just runs this, this program, generates all these random forms, runs them through a selection uh, process. And what he finds is that over time, you get better and better matches to that sequence that binds the receptor. That represents an increase in information. And it's not, again, generated by an intelligent entity. What it is, the only thing that's generated in this information are random mutation, so little variations in the sequence, and this matching process, looking for its, its goodness of fit to a receptor. And so that green line shows, yeah, you get an increase in information. This is in di direct contradiction to what Meyer said, because here's a process that, that is generating new kinds of information over time, increase in the quantity of information. Oh, the red line, by the way, just shows if you remove selection, uh, the random mutation part causes decay and the whole thing will deteriorate down to zero information again within a fairly short period of time. So the point is, we can measure increases in complexity without intelligent input. The other point I want to make is that in order to figure that out, you have to have a nice, sharp, precise definition of information. You need to know what this means in order to measure it. And we have that in Shannon information and in some other information concepts. And that's what we use. I know exactly how Stephen Meyer would address this and how he would complain about my example here. Uh, what he would say is that he expects something called specified complexity. He throws a magic word in there, specify. And suddenly we're not talking about Shannon information anymore. Shannon information isn't about specified complexity. Uh, Shannon information is about something else. What is specified complexity? Well, I read that whole darn 500 page book and I looked everywhere in his book for the definition of specified complexity and this is the closest I found to it. Specified complexity is a synonym for specified information. That's no definition. That doesn't help me in the slightest. Specified is a magic word. You've got to tell me what specified means. Uh, and it, you can't simply synonymize it with uh, information content because we have other metrics for information content, things like Shannon information. How, how do you convert Shannon information into specified information? There's no formula in there. And you look, you look through the book, there are no better definitions of it. Uh, there's no methods described. And, and this is the most, most pathetic of all, uh, they don't even mention the units. Shannon information, and we talk about bits. All you computer science majors here, you know all about this. You know, you measure things in bits. And, and you do that in Shannon information too. Uh, it doesn't tell us what the units are. It just seems to be this nebulous thing that's out there. Uh, there's another fellow who's been criticizing this book, and I recommend him highly, Jeffrey Charlotte. 